H. Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970. 1. Intellectual development of Russell was conditioned by the fact that he was raised outside of official schools. Quote, by the time he was age six, his sister Rachel, his parents, and his grandfather had all died, and he and Frank were left in the care of their grandmother, Countess Russell. So Frank was sent to Winchester School, Bertrand was educated privately at home. End of quote. As a result of this, quote, he became absorbed, absorbed in mathematics from an early age and found the experience of learning Euclidean geometry at the age of 11 as dazzling as first love. End of quote. That is Britannica on Russell. This is significant, as we notice that many men of genius were educated outside the established schools. Some other examples would be Henry Buckle and Edward Tselkowski. 2. Intellectually, Russell developed in a manner similar to my development. From the study of mathematics, he went on to study philosophy, then became engaged in politics, specifically in opposition to World, World War I, whereby he became a socialist, and then he went on to discuss ideas of sexual revolution. See his BBC interview from 1959. 3. Russell's career illustrates that even though the man was from the ruling class of England, the institutions of higher learning are instruments of the ruling class, and they won't accept a person whose ideas go against the grain. Quote, During World War I, Russell for a while was a full-time political agitator, campaigning for peace and against conscription. His activities attracted the attention of the British authorities, who regarded him as subversive. He was twice taken to court, the second time to receive a sentence of six months in a prison which he served at the end of the war. In 1916, as a result of his anti-war campaigning, Russell was dismissed from his lectureship at Trinity College. Although Trinity offered to rehire him after the war, he ultimately turned down the offer, preferring instead to pursue a career as a journalist and freelance writer." End of quote. That is Britannica. As a result, Russell became a socialist. 4. Between the two world wars, Russell was married several times. Together with his wife Dora, he was openly defiant of conventional sexual morality. The views of this couple we would call free law or polyamory. Quote, Dora chose to have two children with another man and insisted on raising them alongside John and Kate, that is the children she had together with Russell. 5. During World War II, 
Russell went to New York where he tried to get a job at the city college. You may say the very opposite of Cambridge where he was educated. However, even here, the view of the ruling class didn't let him teach. Quote, he was prevented from taking a post at the City College of New York because of objections to his views on sex and marriage. End of quote. Britannica. 6. A similar instance of dictatorship we encountered recently when a professor was dismissed from a college in the United States for for proposing as a joke in opposition to President Trump who suggested bombing cultural sites of Iran, making a list of cultural sites of the United States to be bombed by Iran. Washington Post, January 2020. From these and other similar incidents, we gather that no person even mildly critical of the ruling class can or should aspire for a position in the institutions of higher learning. 7. In the book Proposed Roads to Freedom, 1918, Russell compares Marx Marxist theories with facts. These don't quite coincide. 1. Instead of growth in internationalism of the working class, we have a growth of nationalism, for example, as evidenced by World War I. 2. Instead of growing poverty of the mass of population, and specifically the working classes, there is an increasing number of medium and large-scale capitalist companies with a large number of shareholders among the wage earners. 3. Workers of Western industrialized nations have an interest in exploitation of nations that have been colonized. Quote, the psychology of the working man in any of the Western, Western democracies is totally unlike that which is assumed by the Communist Manifesto. He does not by any means feel that he has nothing to lose but his chains, nor indeed is this true. The chains which bind Asia and Africa in sub subjection to Europe are partly riveted by him. He is himself part of a great system of tyranny and exploitation. Universal freedom would remove not only his own chains, which are comparatively light, but the far heavier chains which he has helped to fasten upon the subject races of the world." End of quote. From uh, Bertrand Russell's book, Proposed Roads to Freedom. Objection number one is still true. As for example, there is a growing nationalism in former socialist states. This nationalism stemming from economic interests of the ruling bureaucratic caste, acting in unison with criminal oligarchy. Witness growth of nationalism in China, Russia, etc. I shall not say anything about nationalism of most wage earners from imp the imperialist countries, such as the United States. Objection number two is no longer true. There is a growing poverty among the middle and working classes in the industrialized nations of the world. 
it has been called quote the disappearance of the middle class and it is manifested for example in college graduates taking up work for which no college degree is required objection number three is still true for example my mother who worked for the city government of new york had a part of her salary invested by her trade union in stock shares hence her fortunes were tied to the fortunes of the ruling class of the united states when she comes to ukraine a lower exchange rate of the dollar to the local currency hryvna is bad for her as it means she can buy less commodities meanwhile it is good for the people living in ukraine as it means greater stability and less inflation eight in proposed road to freedom russell asks an important question on the nature of pay under socialism quote there are two questions which need to be considered when we are discussing how far work requires an economic motive the first question is must society give higher pay for the more skilled or socially more valuable work if such work is to be done in sufficient quanti quantities the second question is could work be made so attractive that enough of it would be done even if idlers received just as much of the produce of work end of quote in 1918 these were theoretical questions but now we have practical experience of more than a hundred years one yes society had to give a higher pay to specialists for example immediately after the october revolution of 1917 in russia however today this is not necessary as a lot of advanced scientific and technical work is done just for fun as lena Storvalds, an inventor of linux system put it see his book just for fun two the answer to the second question is already given yes work in the sense of creativity can be very attractive in fact a way of self-expression and those who do it can receive just as much as those who are idle some subsistence level should be provided to all including idlers sometimes these people will carry with them seeds of the future progress as for example such poet as joseph brodsky from the viewpoint of the soviet state of 1950s and 60s was an idler nine the most important work of Bertrand Russell I consider to be The Practice and Theory of Bolshevism, 1920. This is because here in part two, devoted to Bolshevik theory, he considers materialist conception of history. The meaning of it is that all the mass phenomena of history are determined by economic motives however since the formation of transitional states 
starting with Soviet Russia in 1917. Things have become more complicated. Russell writes, In spite of the fundamental importance of economic facts in determining the politics and beliefs of an age or nation, I do not think that non-economic factors can be neglected without risks of errors which may be fatal in practice. End of quote. It is inter-imperialist rivalries which have caused World War I. These are not economic factors properly, but political factors. In 1917, Soviet Russia was formed, and a new determining factor has appeared in international politics. Hostility of imperialist states towards states in transition towards socialism, that is, transitional states. This is not simply a rivalry of clans, as we have seen, for example, in Romeo and Juliet of Shakespeare, or a rivalry of competing imperial states, as in the case of World War I, but rivalry between old and new social economic systems, rivalry between capitalism and socialism carried onto the international scene. And it is this rivalry which is determining modern international politics, as main tensions are today between the groups of states behind the United States, that is NATO, and the groups of states grouped around China and Russia, the so-called BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Meanwhile, the so-called left have all called modern Russia and China imperialist, revealing themselves as supporters of capitalism. Rivalries between competing social economic systems in space, in arms, in social economic development, in sports, in science, technology and education, etc., is what determines geopolitics today and ultimately the fate of our planet. It is not only a struggle between social classes, but between different social economic systems. In the words of Russell, the Marxian class war if it ever comes about, is more likely to be a war between capitalist and proletarian nations that, than a civil war between capitalists and proletarians in each country. End of quote. The U.S. working class may well be with its capitalists. However, it will be opposed by proletarian nations, by which we mean transitional states, such as Russia and China. 10. It is curious to observe that the de determining factors behind the breakup of transitional states are rivalries between local competing gangs of criminals that is, oligarchs plus top bureaucrats, behind which we find either an imperialist state or a transitional state. For example, behind the war in Ukraine, we find the EU, the United States, and Russia. 11. Bertrand Russell in 1920 foresaw 
what is likely to happen in Russia, as opposed to many Bolshevik leaders and international socialists. Selling oneself to the capitalists is not the only possible form of treachery. It is also possible, having acquired power, to use it for one's own ends instead of for the people. This is what I believe to be likely to happen in Russia. The establishment of a bureaucratic aristocracy, concentrating authority in its own hands and creating a regime just as oppressive and cruel as that of capitalism. Ultimately, this was caused by the lack of industrial development in the country, and hence a need for dictatorial and oligarchic methods of control. For similar reasons, modern revolutionary movements cannot attain victories in such countries as Colombia and El Salvador. Industrialization is best achieved under capitalist regime and methods of administration, if it can be achieved at all. If industrialization could not be achieved under capitalism, the law of combined development came into play, and the stage of capitalism was skipped to achieve industrialization under socialist methods. However, there is a period of restoration in these revolutions, during which capitalism is partially restored. Meanwhile, the states which attempt to jump over the stage of capitalism and move to industrialization using methods of socialism cannot do it, as socialism, for example, in the former USSR, China, etc., has discredited itself. It makes no sense to sacrifice one's life for the sake of former revolutionary leaders driving in Ferraris. As Tanya Nijmeijer in her diary from Colombia describes. Hence, there is an impasse. Peace is not possible in these countries, but war according to the existing models, for example, led by PKK in Turkey or led by FARC in Colombia is not an alternative either. Solution has to be postponed, which happens often in scientific and technical experiments, but in a social one, it is rather painful. 12. Russell outlines conditions for a successful communist revolution, chapter 7 of part 2. First, that nothing can succeed until America is either converted to communism or at any rate willing to remain neutral. And we know there is no such thing as neutrality in politics. First condition for a success of a global communist revolution is revolution in the United States, or at least inability to interfere in international events due to internal turmoil. The real question is how to make America communist? if it exploits most of the world and its ruling classes share the crumbs of their profits 
with its population. Russell continues. Secondly, that it is a mistake to attempt to inaugurate communism in a country where the majority are hostile, or rather, where the active opponents are as strong as the active supporters. Because in such a state of opinion, a very severe civil war is likely to result. It is necessary to have a great body of opinion favorable to communism and a rather weak opposition before a really successful communist state can be introduced either by revolution or by more or less constitutional methods. People must be persuaded by different means of propaganda and agitation before an attempt at armed rising may be risked. The third condition for a successful communist revolution would be self-government in major industries. Wage earners must be used to making decisions that affect their livelihood. This is the real meaning of the word democracy, the participation of the people in affairs. 13. In Prospects of Industrial Civilization, written in 1923, Russell continues the topic of self-government by the workers by noting that in the early days of the Industrial Revolution in England, gangs of working men broke up the machinery of the mills because machinery produced the same output with less labor and therefore threw men out of work. If working men had, uh, had control of methods of production in those days, the industrial revolution could never have taken place. Hence, there is a need for dictatorship in the early stages of industrialization. Lenin has called for a one-man rule Yedino Nachalia in industries after 1919. See the so-called trade union discussion. But this is to be replaced by self-government of the workers in societies which have industrialized and developed new, more advanced methods of production, for example, nanotechnologies.